sound great. Turn to your neighbor and say, good job. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, it's great to have you here this morning. We have a God who is for us no matter what we go through. Aren't you thankful for that this morning? Aren't you thankful that no matter what we do, he's always there? A loving, faithful, a true God, a faithful friend. No matter where we walk or what our thoughts are at times, he's so faithful. He's so precious to us. Today, if you're facing anything in your life, I'm here to tell you there's a God who loves you. There's a God who sees the struggles in your life. He's right here today for you. You can trust him because he is for you. If our God is for us, no one or nothing can be against us. So patient, so constant, so loving and so true, so powerful, and all you do, you fill me, you see me, you know my every move, you love for me to sing to
world full of chaos. In a world that we kind of see that it's all about what I can get, what I can do. It's easy to forget that if God is for us, no one or anything could be ever be against us. That we don't have to strive and we don't have to fight and we don't have to, we don't have to go after things that, that we so desire, we so want. All we gotta do is trust in the one who can already do it, because he is for you. Today you may be here and as you're kind of standing here or sitting here in this place, you're kind of just letting those words kind of speak to you. Maybe you don't even feel like they're worthy, you're worthy of them. You maybe don't even feel like you deserve for God to be for you, maybe because of decisions you've made or attitudes or actions or thoughts you've had, and you don't even feel like you're worthy of that. You don't even feel like God should even love you. Well, I'm here to tell you today, regardless of how you feel, God loves you and he cares for you and he is for you. And all he wants you to do is just trust him. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. And it says, the word says, he will direct your paths. See, because when Jesus steps in, darkness has to step out. When Jesus comes on the scene, sickness is healed. When Jesus comes in, depression is made light. Whenever Jesus comes on the scene, things change because that's who he is. He is for you today. If you're here this morning, you need a touch from God and need him just to encourage you in some way, would you do me a favor today? Would you just, in the sincerity of this time, in this moment, could you just lift your hands all across this place? You need something from God today. You need him to touch you in some way. Would you just lift your one hand up? Just lift it up. Hands going up. Thank you. Thank you. Just have it. Lift them up for just a second. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for God to touch you. God, for every hand that is raised, you are for them. You are for them, God. And if you are for them, then God, no one or anything can be against them. So Lord, I pray for the hands that are raised that represent the lives that are forever changed. That God, you would encourage them today. That you would let them know that God, you are right there beside them. Encourage their hearts. Bring them your peace. Bring them your comfort because you are for them.
just feel like there's some here today, one or two or many, many, maybe many of you that there's darkness, discouragement. Maybe it's in your personal life or maybe it's with a relationship or maybe it's beyond your even home, but you see it. Right now, I just want to pray for you, Father God, for those that are discouraged, for those that maybe God are looking to other ways to find provision or find hope. Jesus, you're the only hope we need. And may you bring to them the life. May you bring to them hope for those discouraged hearts today, for those that are, that, are, that are saddened today, for those who are heavy in their spirits today. This morning, God, how I ask you that you would be their encouragement and you would be their hope and that, God, you would, you would wipe those tears and you would say, I have you and you would let them know that you are for them. And Jesus, all they have to do is call upon you. All they have to do is trust you and God, you do the impossible. So Lord, for those lives, I ask you right now, touch them, strengthen them, bring your life to them. We thank you, God, that we have one we call on the name of Jesus. All hope is filled in him. Can we sing that one more time? Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Listen. Jesus, you silence fears. You silence fears. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. Father, thank you so much. Let your word speak life into us today. Encourage us. Take us through the dark times because we can trust you no matter what. Be with us, I pray, and strengthen us in your word today. And everybody said, amen. You may be seated. Raindrops are falling on my head. And just like the guy his feet are too big for his bed. Nothing seems to fit those Raindrops are falling on my head and they keep falling. Raindrops keep falling on my head. But that doesn't mean my eyes will soon be turning red. The cry is not for me because I'm never gonna stop the rain by complaining because I'm free. Nothing's worrying me. All right, it's great to have you guys here this morning. Open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to turn there and look there in just a moment. Uh, it's so wonderful to have you here. Thank you for choosing Cross View to worship today. We pray that uh, you hear something, inspired by something, but most importantly, you leave here with more of God than when you came, because that's what it's all about. Uh, so thank you so much again for being here. Uh, we are... And our last day, last week of this series um, that's called Overwhelmed. We've been doing this all summer long. Great season for this message. If you missed any, we have been talking about everything that's been going on in the world. We've been talking about all the craziness that's happened around us and how we can become overwhelmed by it. Uh, but the, how God's word and how God's truth helps us to navigate those seasons and navigate that time uh, in our life, whatever you're facing, whether it's good uh, whether it's bad, it doesn't really matter. We all have seasons of our life that we get overwhelmed. Anybody in here ever get overwhelmed by life? Just raise your hand up. Yeah, this week's just another example of a week. The Duracho, Duricho, Nacho Chizo came through. I don't know what the name of it is, but uh, he came through Iowa this past week. And, you know, so many lives devastated uh, just in a, a windstorm, just a, just a, a it's kind of a weird, freaky thing that upturned so many lives, and uh, we just never know some things that happen. I mean, you would not think that anything like that would ever take place, and yet it does, and uh, people's lives are changed on a, an instantly. Uh, you know, we just no, don't ever know what's going on, so Philippians has been about this. It's about when life gives you things that are hard, whenever you're struggling in life, whenever maybe you have a circumstance that goes on that is outside of your control, how do we handle it? 
How do we handle when a pandemic hits us, when the economy shuts down, and a windstorm, a hurricane-like windstorm, hits the center of the United States and Iowa? How do we handle, how do we navigate, how do we walk through those particular things? And so we've been learning over the last several weeks about what did Paul tell us? How did Paul instruct us to handle those things? And he's been teaching us through Philippians. We're just going from Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, all the way up through today. We're going to finish out the book of Philippians, and uh, we're going to learn some more inspiring things he's going to tell us. But here's what we've learned so far. We've learned that life is going to deal us blows. And in the book of Philippians, Paul is chained. He's in prison. He's awaiting his execution by the emperor Nero. He is on death row for preaching the gospel, for preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. And he is literally in the last few years of his life, but he isn't silent. He isn't fearful. He does not, he does not fear what his future holds because he knows who holds his future. And it wasn't Nero, it was God. And so he takes the opportunity in Philippians to speak to the people in Philippi to encourage them in their faith. And here's what he does. He says 17 times. He uses different expressions, different uh, ways of saying it. He talked about rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. He said, consider pure joy, my brothers, when you face troubles or problems of many kinds. For why? They have a testing of your faith. Many of us, our faith has been so tested and I'm here to tell you the test is not over. Our faith is going to be tested from here into the grave. It's not about what our faith is test. It's how we pass the test of our faith. How do we pass the test of our faith? And I just got to be real with you today. Let's just be honest. Sometimes we pass it with flying colors. Other times we fail completely. Because faith is something that it can be really strong one day, and when you're hit with something big, can topple you and start to shake the foundation of what you believe. Don't believe that. When your life is on a certain path and a certain journey, and you get hit with the loss of a child, that'll rock your faith. Whenever you're traveling down a journey and you one day get a knock on your front door and it's a, it's a letter delivered to you that you are going through a divorce, that'll rock your world. Whenever you're journeying down life and everything is good, the economy is good, and all of a sudden you lose a 401k, goes down to a 201k, it'll rock your world. Because why? Faith is one of those things that we have lots of faith when things are good, but when things get challenging and struggling, we get shook back a little bit. So Paul, in the book of Philippians, he's at a place where he has every reason in the world for his faith to be kind of shaky. He's waiting his execution. He's chained up to a guard 24 hours a day, chained up. It's our version of home, home uh, when you're, you're on home, uh, what's it, home, home prison, home jail, I don't even know what that means. What is the word? Not home alone. No, Pastor Terry. <laughs> House arrest. Thank you very much. That's a movie. Um, but good try. Thanks for trying. You tried. Uh, when you're under house arrest, this would be equivalent to house arrest, except you have a human being on the other end of your chains. Four hours a day, they change out another guard. And I talked about this the last couple of weeks. I talked about what Paul used that opportunity for. And Paul throughout Philippians talks about how to enjoy life, even in the middle of very trying times. He talked about how to handle conflict. And we talked about that the last several weeks. If you've missed any, go back online and listen to the series Overwhelm. How to find satisfaction in life whenever life is not very satisfying. We learned how to be a man on Father's Day. We learned how to succeed in life, how to win in life, how to overcome in life. See, there's two reasons why Paul wrote the book of Philippians. Two reasons. The first one was he, wrote a, he was writing a thank you letter to the church in Philippi. He was thanking them because they had done something extremely great for the life of Paul. And it's also a receipt. It's a receipt showing that because of their faith, 
God was going to continue to promote the gospel. He wrote the book of Philippians to show them, hey, your gift that you gave to me made such a powerful impact in my life that now I can continue on to preach the good news of Jesus Christ because of your faith. There's an old joke that talks about one day a pastor of the church was going through some financial struggles, and uh, they didn't know how they were going to make it, and they took up the offering that day, and there was a check in there for $1,000. The pastor got so excited, he, he, he looked at the check, and he said, Sister Matilda, thank you so much for your generosity. Come up here. Would you please come up here? She's a really shy lady. She gets up there, and she goes, oh, I didn't want to be kind. He's like, that's okay. Listen, because of your faithfulness, we will allow you, I want you to pick out three hymns that we, that we will give to you today. And she went, three hymns? And he said, yeah. She said, okay, I'll take him and him and him. <laughs> if you would, open your Bibles to chapter, Philippians chapter 4, verse 14. Here in the concluding moments of this letter... Paul is bringing everything together, and he's beginning to wrap this thing up. He's beginning to do the conclusion. He's beginning to say his final thoughts that he has. He spoke a lot of different things. He said uh, many different things, wonderful things throughout this passage. But here in Philippians chapter 4, uh, verse 14, he's going to expound upon what he's going to say. And here's what he says. He says, Yet it was good for you to share in my troubles. He's telling the, the church in Philippi, hey, it was good that you journeyed with me in this. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance or our acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, Philippi, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except only you. For even I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. So Paul's saying here, listen, even when I wasn't with you, you still helped me financially. You helped me through the struggles of my life. It says, verse 17, not that I desire your gifts or not that I beg for them. What I desire is that more, more be credited to your account, that I speak about what you have done and the generosity that you've done, not because you need it, but because I want you to be understanding that it came to me at a great need. It goes on to say this in verse 18. It says, I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied. Now that I have received from Aphrodite the, the gifts you sent, they are a fragrant offering, acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God, say this with me, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And here's the final verse. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Father God, let your word speak life to us today. May it not just, may we just, not just be hearers of it, but doers of it. Lord, allow your spirit to come into this room and just begin to open our hearts. That God, who we are, and what we do, and how we are generous with who, what you have blessed us with, God, means so much to the eternal difference in others' lives. So, Lord, I pray that you'll speak, you'll preach, and you'll touch hearts in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Verse 19 says, and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Today, I want to talk with you in our final moments, and it's kind of summarizing what, what Paul is saying here. I want to talk with you about this promise that God has given all of us to meet all of our needs. It's an overwhelming generosity that we get from God himself. God's promise is to meet all your needs, not some of your needs, not your wants, but all your needs. Many times we don't know what we need. We think we know what we need. We think we know we need a car, but what kind of car do we need? Well, I need the fastest car. I need the prettiest car. I need the nicest car. And usually when you get that need, you also get the debt of the need, right? God says, I will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. And today I look, I see in these passages two things. I see the promise that God will meet my needs, but I see a premise that I must do in order for God to meet my needs. 
Every promise has a premise. The premise is the setup. It's the, it's the agreement that you're putting down so the promise can come true. For example, you go get a house loan for your house, your, you know, for your mortgage. You are making a premise, and the premise is, I will make monthly payments to you, and you are going to give me the money that I need for my house, and you're going to charge me an interest rate, and I will make that. I, I, the premise is I'm setting up the, the setup, and the promise from the bank is we won't come take your house as long as you do what we ask you to do, right? This is the way life works. God, too, in these verses, there is a premise and there is a promise. We all want the promise. The promise is that God will meet all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Yeah, come on now, preach it. That's good stuff, right? But we cannot have the promise until we understand the premise. So number one, if you have your notes, write this down. Number one, the first thing is we have the premise. And the premise is this. I must be generous to others. The premise is we want God to be generous to us. We must be generous to others. Here's what Proverbs 11.25 says. It says a generous person will run or will prosper he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed you give you're generous it will come back to you luke says this luke 6 38 give to others and god will give to you the measure you use for others is the one that god will measure for you that means if you give generously to others hands open then God will give back to you, hands open. But if you give stingily or not at all, you cannot expect it to come back to you because the same measure you give is the same measure you will receive back into your life. The premise, the premise is, in order to get to the promise, the first step is we must be generous. Here at Crossview, I say this quite often. That means we're gonna be generous with our time our talents, and our treasures. Our time, our talents, and our treasures. What is time? Time is the, probably one of the most vital things, the most valuable things you really have in this world. We always think it's money, but it's not. Your time is very valuable. Your time is worth something. And sometimes in life, God wants you to take your time and give it to somebody. Now, I'm not talking about your job because you're getting paid for that. That's not giving anything away. None of you in here in this place say, I want to give my boss a few more free hours. Right? Nobody's, nobody's with me in that. I mean, anybody? You're crazy if you are. Uh, nobody does that. Nobody says, I want to just, I'm just going to gift my time. But God does want us to be generous with our time. For example, if there is something that you can do to help somebody out, somebody rake a yard or clean a house or clean gutters out, you give them your time without them asking, you go and do it. That is a time thing. Serving at the church, serving outside the church, even more so because that's bigger testimony. This is all about timing and being generous with that time. Instead of uh, playing the video games from sunup to sundown to sunup to sundown the next day, take of your time and maybe help dad do something around the house or mom do something around the house. That's shocking. I see all the parents looking at their kids going, mm-hmm, yeah, that'd be nice. Time. Being generous with our time. Secondly, being generous with our talents. What are, you, what are you good at? What are you good at? If, if you're good at computer stuff, maybe you use that to be able to help somebody who's not. If you're good at, uh, at maybe fixing or good with your hands and working things, maybe you give of your talents to help someone else. Being generous with your talents. The last one is treasures, and everybody knows what that is. It's money. It's what you work for. It's your checks. It's your cash. It's what comes in. Generous with your treasures. See a need? It's not yours, and you open-handedly give to the need of the moment. This is the time, talent, and treasures principle. This is how we give. See? You give, you can never outgive the principle of generosity. You can't give enough time, you can't give overgive talents, and you can't overgive your treasures. 
because God is always bigger. See, generosity frees open the floodgates for God to do amazing things in your life. Stinginess blocks God from blessing you. When you think it's all yours, your time is yours, your talents are yours, your, your treasures are yours, when you hold it in and you hold it close to your chest, God cannot freely bless your life. This isn't prosperity preaching. This is biblical preaching of what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, listen, when I was in need, you thought of me. And because you thought of me, it inspired me to continue on. Your generosity made it possible for me to continue to move on. Paul gives three reasons why, being gen why we should be generous. First one is this. He says, my giving is an encouragement to others. It says in verse 14, it says, It was good for you to share in my troubles, as you Philippians know, in the early days. Not one church shared with me uh, in, the, in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. Even for uh, whenever I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again. Paul's saying, listen, you encouraged me when I needed it the most. Now listen. The church in Philippi, the people in Philippi were poor. They weren't very wealthy. It wasn't a very wealthy church by any means. Uh, they had poverty at high levels inside their church. They experienced the ups and downs that society was full to them, but they were big hearted. In fact, the church of Philippi reminds me of the church in a little town called Keokuk, Iowa, called Crossview. I'm not saying that because I'm the pastor. I, many of you don't know my story, and some of you do. But I have been uh, coming to this church. I was not raised here. I was raised native from St. Louis. And, uh, and I grew up coming here when I was age 10 to different revivals in my family. And I kind of told you the story and everything like that. Went to Bible college and, and all this kind of things. But I want you to know that of all the churches, my family traveled to thousands of churches. We sang in thousands of churches all around the Midwest area. We had relationships with many pastors throughout the whole area. And Crossview was always a church that cared for us as a group. I never thought I'd ever be a pastor at this church. In fact, I remember whenever uh, they were hiring and it came across my desk and Ty and Paul, they, they, we were at a, a youth retreat. They booked me to preach at to try to get me to come. They were just working it. Um, and we were sitting in the pool and we were, we were cooling off and they were saying, what's it going to take? What's it going to take? And I was like, I said, there is no way I'm going to Keokuk, Iowa. I'm not going to Keokuk, Iowa. And, uh, and so we we, uh, we continued to move on. They went through many different things and many different uh, other youth pastors and pastors before I came. And then one day it was just like God just set it up and said, okay, now it's time for you to go. But before that all came to pass, let me tell you what happened. When I went to Bible college, I needed, uh, I was a youth pastor at a church. I was leaving everything to go do Bible college, uh, to, to feel the call of God and lead, be led by the call of God. And I asked for people to sponsor. I asked people for financially to support on a monthly basis. And of all the churches and all the places that I sent letters out to, this church was number one in all the generosity and all the monthly support. Michelle and they didn't know what they were doing. They were just supporting people that they cared about. They didn't, had no idea that I was going to be their pastor. They had no idea, surely, that I'd be here 16 years. They might have stopped supporting me a little bit earlier. Um, <laughs> they had no idea. And, and it's been one of those things that this church, I've watched this church before. This is far before I was the pastor. I've watched this church do things for this community without ever getting any recon recognition or anything because they wanted to encourage the people around. See, the results of our giving is this. It, it gives us a wider ministry. Whenever we're generous with our time, talent, and treasures, it allows us to have influence into the community. 16 years ago, whenever I came, I started doing a, um, I was approached by the, the principal at the middle school to start a, uh, a kind of a Bible study. It wasn't, you couldn't really use Bible, but he said, listen, we're going to do a get together uh, on, on uh, Tuesday morning, or I'm sorry, Thursday mornings, and we'll just see who comes. He goes, uh, I want you to come and I want you to speak. And I remember I said, you know what, I'm going to give them donuts. I'm going to give them, and at the time, our church didn't have all the money in the world, and there was going to be a, a weekly amount that was being put out. And I remember going into that school and uh, 
just kind of speaking to the kids and giving them donuts. They were just coming for the donuts. Let's just face it. They just, they didn't care nothing about me or what I was saying. It was donuts, you know? Um, but every week we kept doing donuts, donuts, donuts. Grew that uh, daily buzz, we called it, to over 100 students every single week coming in, grabbing a donut, but they had, we had an audience that they had to listen, and we would preach, and we would tell them about who Christ was. Because why? The generosity of a donut opened up the opportunity for some child to, to, to come to know Christ. And we've had several students come through the youth ministry, get saved. We had one girl that, I won't mention her by name, but God, we, didn't, we thought she was going to die. We were going to kill her before she ever made it through the youth ministry. She was so, so much a mess. She was a mess, you know? But she came in, God touched her, God changed her, and she's a beautiful, beautiful person. Why? Because generosity widens our ministry influence. Second thing is, generosity or giving makes me more like God. For God so loved the world that he did what? What did he do? He, come on now, you, got, you guys can, for, we all know this, John three sixteen. come on. For God so loved the world that he, he gave. Think about if God was stingy and close fist like many of us. Think about what our future would be if God said, you know what, I'm going to do a lot for him, but I'm not giving my son Jesus because that's way too much. Think about if Jesus would have said when he was getting beat, when he was getting smacked around, when he's getting nails, put in his wrists and feet, crown of thorns forced upon his head, suspended between heaven and earth on a cross. What if Jesus would have said, okay, that's enough. I tap out. I've done enough for them. They're on their own. Imagine that. But yet, as human beings, we do it every day. We're stingy with our time. We're stingy with our talents. We're stingy with our treasures. Giving makes us more like Jesus. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, he says, Paul calls them an example, the Philippians, for the rest of the world. Paul wrote in many of his letters the testimony of who the Philippians were. Because why? They were living like Jesus. Second thought is this, giving, my giving, is an investment in the future. It says in verse 17, it says, Though I appreciate your gifts, what makes me happiest is well-earned reward you, ha- you, you will live because of your kindness. He's saying, listen, what you've done today affects the future. How generous you are today sends ripple effects in the rest of your world. You know, when you, as a kid, you throw that rock in the, in the stream or in the river, and you just like to see the ripples, and you watch how far out. I, as a kid, I tried to count them. I tried to, like, track them how far out they went. Paul says generosity has a ripple effect in our life. If you're generous with your time, other people will be generous in giving time to you. If you're generous with your talents, God will give you opportunity for your talents to be used and even honed and made better. If you're generous with your money, God may not return to you a check in the mail and you know cash and money in your bank, but you know what he'll do? He'll bless you in ways you never can understand by driving cars that should not even be on the road running. If they were in other states, they'd be legal, you know? I mean, these put out more emissions than anything else. And I was so glad when I moved to the state of Iowa and you didn't do emissions tests because I came from Missouri. And they, they did all the emissions tests. They even have the little truck that went around and would like, they could tell what car was putting out bad emissions and they would ticket you on the highway. They would smell your emissions. It was crazy. I'm so glad when I moved to, I moved to Iowa and I saw some of the cars in the road and said, hot dog, I'm home because I can drive an old car. Good job. God says, the banks may pay interest, but God pays the highest dividends ever. Why? Because giving, our giving is an encouragement to others. Our giving is an investment in the future. Third thought is this. Our giving... Uh, is a sacrifice to God. If, if you've ever had to make a sacrifice, a real sacrifice, and let's just be very honest, in America, we don't make a whole lot of sacrifices. We, 
I mean, you take away our phones, we think that's a sacrifice. I give my phone up for one hour at church, that's a sacrifice. We don't know what sacrifice is, really, in America. Here's what verse 18 says. I'm amply satisfied now that I have received from Aphrodite the gift you sent me. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. In the Bible, sacrifice, a physical sacrifice, was something that as Christians was outlawed, but the very first one that, that uh, up until then that, that was not, uh, that almost went through was the story of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son that was promised, the son that God said, I will give you a son, he will, be, he will multiply and you'll have as many children and grandchildren and descendants as the sand by the sea, and yet they couldn't even have a son. One day, he, he gives birth to this his little boy, Isaac, and all the joy I'm sure that was in his heart, the, the pride he must have felt as a father to hold for his first time his son. Fast forward a few years, and as Abraham was serving God, and as Abraham was trying to obey God, God told Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son to me. Imagine that. It's exactly what I've been talking about, overwhelmed. Imagine your world is going great, all the things are coming to pass, and all of a sudden something topples your faith. Abraham's faith was, I'm sure, shaky. Abraham's faith was sure questioned. But what does he do? He loads up his son. He says, son, let's go up the mountain for sacrifice. The son would ask. Isaac would say, well, I'm sure, dad, where's the sacrifice? Where's the animal? Where's the lamb? Where's... Where's the ram? Where's, where's the thing we're going to sacrifice? And Abraham said, the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. Yet deep down, Abraham believed the provision was his one and only son. The story goes on that they built up the altar. Abraham took and tied his son and placed him on the altar. He took out his dagger and he pulled it up ready to kill Isaac, and just as he did, God stopped and said no. And there was, a, there was a ram that was in the thicket, and they provided the sacrifice. And Abraham proved that day that God tests our faith, and yet God provides a sacrifice. He didn't have to lose his son. Think about this. Abraham didn't have to lose his son, but God did. God could have taken whenever they were beating this son, he could have stopped it, but instead he said, that is the sacrifice needed, and this is what giving is all about. For God so loved that he gave. It's a fragrant offering, rising to God, sacrificial gift. A sacrificial person, a giving person, a generous person. You ever been around these? A generous person are awesome to be around. I love being around generous people. But you ever been around a greedy person? You ever been around a stingy person? Don't look at them. Just look at me. Just don't look at them. You ever been around somebody that whenever you, uh, you go out to eat, you know, they, they, they say, hey, let's go out to eat. Well, to me, if you say let's go out to eat, that means you're buying, Right? And you go out to eat with them, and they sit down, and they say, uh, yeah, separate checks. And you say, well, that's a weird, Kevin. Okay, well, that's the way I look at it. That's why I don't ask any of you to go out to eat, because I don't want to pay for your food. No, I'm just joking with you. No, I met stingy people, stingy people that, that just seem to want to hoard everything. Because why? They're selfish. It's all about them. It's all about their money. It's all about what they want to do with it. Well, giving is a sacrifice to God. It's a fragrant offering. The generosity that you give is the same generosity that will come back on you. Misers are miserable because they never really enjoy the fruits of their generosity. Now, so that's the premise. The premise is, in order for you to have all your needs supplied according to the riches in God's glory, the only way you can have the promise is you must do the premise. The premise is, I must be generous. I must give of my time, my talents, and my treasures. I must live beyond myself, help those around me. If they're in need, I give. If there's something they need, I figure out a way to do it. 
I don't do it publicly. You don't post it on Facebook. You don't put it on social media. All the generosity things you're doing, don't do that. Because generosity in its purest form is to be done without anybody knowing. Many times I have, I have watched that happen in my life. People have done things for me that I don't even know who it was. I still don't know this day who it was. That's the generosity God is talking about. And if we do that, it leads me to my second thought is this, the promise. The promise is that my God will supply. It is the believer's insurance policy. You do this, the premise, God says, I will do that. You give of your time, you give of your talents, you give of your treasures, and I will supply. Who's our source? The th first thought is this, our source is God. God is the source of all generosity. He's the one who gives and takes away. He is the source of all things. You have a job today, you have a job today, or you go through a jobless time, when you provided for it, it is the source that comes from God and God alone. That's, he's the source. The second thought I have, the scope. He says, I will meet all your needs. How many? Say it with me. How many? All, all your needs. Now listen, that's not your wants, it's your needs. Food, clothing, shelter. In fact, study was done. Study was done uh, in 1890. 1890, a study was done and uh, the study was, what do human beings actually need? 1890. I'm not going to go through the list, but the list was made up of 16 things, 16 items that you absolutely need as a human being to survive. Fast forward several hundred years later, that list has gone from 16 to 2,300. Think about 2,300, I can't even think of 16, much less 23, but I'm sure I have them, trust me. I'm sure they're there. I'm not, I'm not, I just haven't taken a lot of time to think about it. It's just interesting to me that, that how a society, we have advanced and we have developed to the point that we feel like we need more than what we actually need. Happens in all parts of our lives. See, there are, Many people out there misuse this verse, God will supply all my needs according to riches and glory. They misuse this verse, and they almost say, God will provide all my wants and needs because he's good. This category does not include consequences of laziness. Are you all hearing me? There is a consequence to being lazy. For example, if you're an able-bodied person and you're able to work, you're to work. No amens on that one? Okay, good. The Bible says the sluggard does not produce and therefore has nothing going for him. But yet it says an ant works tirelessly and has much to show. If you do not work, if you're lazy, if you need money and you're offered a job or opportunity to make money, you say, you say hey, I want you to come and uh, scrub my trash cans or scrub my toilets. That's disgusting. But if you have an opportunity and you need money, God has supplied your need by providing a place for you to financially get that from. Now, some of you young people need to listen to me. You're going to have to do disgusting things in your life. Disgusting things. Nothing's above you. Nothing, nothing is too good that you cannot do. Nothing, oh, I'm too good to do that. Trust me, the Lord will test you in that. I have done disgusting things that I'm in the middle of, and I'm doing it, and I'm going, good Lord, why am I doing this? Oh, yeah, i got to pay a bill this month i got to put food on my kid's table, and God provided me this opportunity. People who are unwilling, not unable, unwilling 
to work should not be given handouts. Let him who does not work not eat. This is 1 Thessalonians 3.10. I'm all for I'm all for welfare, helping out those who have been hit by life, but I'm not all for welfare that people live day in and day out, not just that, but generation upon generation upon generation. And this is, I get it, this is, this is countercultural. You might want to do a cancel on me. You might want to knock me out, do a cancel culture on me. I got it, because that's what everybody does. When they don't like what you say, they cancel you. But this is the truth. Our world is the way it is because far too many people think Everyone else needs to provide for them instead of them providing for themselves. Mm. It's hard preaching, but it's truth. I'm not saying if you had a job and COVID hit and now you're unemployed or your work is going through a hard time and you're the, there, there are resources that have been provided for this season, man, let God use that to bless and enrich your life. But remember, it's not the government that's doing it for you. It's God. And God asks us to step up and go out and work and do and earn. James chapter 3 says this. You ask, you ask for something, and when you didn't get it, when you don't get it, it's because you're asking with wrong motives. It says that will meet all your needs according to my riches and glory. See, Everybody wants to be a millionaire. Nobody wants to be poor. And here's the thing. They're both, both those attitudes are wrong. It's not about being a millionaire. It's not about being poor. It's about your attitude in the season that you're in. And what are you doing with the wealth that God's given you right now? How are you handling the money that God has blessed you with right now? How are you handling the time that God's given you right now? How are you handling the talents? Because if you misuse it, if you squander your time, your talent, and your treasures away, God's up there going, what can I give you? I can't give you more if you don't use what I've given you already. And Paul is saying to the Philippians, you did good. You provided my needs. All financial needs, all physical needs, all emotional needs, all relational needs. God is the source. The scope is all. And the third one is this. He will supply according to his riches and glory. God owns it all. He owns the cattle on the thousand hills and all the land that is underneath it. He is the all-knowing, all-blessing God. And no matter what you're facing today, no matter how big the bills may seem, if you put God priority in your finances, you put God center of your resources, God will provide for you all your needs. Sam Walton was one of the wealthiest men in America. If he wrote you a check for $1,000 that was given out his riches, he wouldn't miss it. But if Sam Walton would have wrote you a check, or would have wrote you a check and didn't put an amount on it and said, do what you want with it, you'd all be like, oh yeah. Out of his riches, he would immensely bless us. Here's what a parallel passage says. This is in 2 Corinthians, okay? So remember, we're in Philippians, the letter to Philippians. The Philippians are, he's encouraging them, saying, thank you for generosity, I appreciate all you've done. Now he's writing another letter to another church in Corinth. And here's what he said about the Philippians, uh, to, the, to the Corinthians about the Philippians. He said, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. Each one of you should give whatever he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under pressure, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to what? Make all grace abound to you so that what? All things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. You cannot outgive God. I don't preach this message because cross you need your money. Because listen, it's not about cross you need your money. It's about obedience in your time and being generous in your time, talents, and treasures. 
Every year we do Christmas time. Every year we go and we, we stress out, we buy all these presents and we wrap all these presents up and we, 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 we get so excited about giving the presents away because we want to see how happy they are when they get the presents and that they're so excited and we give our kid, man, we go so, we go nine miles an hour, 900 miles just to make our kid happy about this gift. You ever had a kid open his gift and go, Really? This is what I got? Mine was always close socks. My aunt always gave us socks. Stupid socks for Christmas. God, because he's generous, doesn't waste the generosity to you. Some of you today, some of you today, just being very honest with you, some of you today are facing financial hardship. You don't, maybe your job is not in right now, or maybe you are just struggling financially. Maybe you made decisions in the past that just really didn't go anywhere. And so you're struggling. I'm here to tell you, put God first in your finances. Say, what does that mean, Pastor Kevin? Well, what it means for me, this is for me, the very first of everything I get in, the very first 10%, I dedicate to God. I take it off the top. It's written, it's given right back to the church, the local church. Whether or not I've, I haven't paid a single bill, that's the first thing I do, very first. I've been doing that since I was, and I really didn't start till I was 18 years old. I didn't understand the whole idea of giving and, and tithing and generosity. And I know that for me, it's the only way that my family has been able to make it financially, not because we've held God to the standard that I'm giving, so give it back to me. No, no, God, you're first in our finances, and I don't know how you're gonna provide, but I know if I trust you, you will. Somehow, some way, somehow, you will. There are other things that, that we can do. We can, not just tithing, but someone, a neighbor needs help uh, with the car repair. Instead of them going and spending, you know, thousands of dollars at a car place to get fixed. You have some automotive skills and you have YouTube. Best automotive skill ever. I love YouTube. I can fix anything with YouTube. It takes me a little longer than they do in 12 minutes, but it's still. And you, you say, hey, you don't need to go spend that money for brakes or for or oil change or whatever. Don't worry. Hey, bring them to my house. I'll help you do it. I'll do it for you. you take your talents and you invest it and you put it in another person. All of us have something we can do. You may not have money, maybe you don't have money to give, but you have talents or you have time that you can give to somebody. And let me tell you something, if the church, and I'm not talking about cross I'm talking about the church at large, if the church would ever get this, this world would be a whole different place. Because we would take care of each other. We'd help each other out when the times were hard. Giving is not a matter of wealth. It's a matter of willingness to give. God could care less about how much you give. What he cares about is that you know it's not yours anyway. He owns it all. And I give because he freely gave it to me. Time, talent, treasures. Time. Go on a missions trip. I know there's groups right now that are planning to go to the northern part of Iowa. Uh, we are actually doing some in, in house searching of organizations that we can help out that were hit with these storms this past week. We're sending financial. We're already sending financial. If you want to give some to find, if you want to give some of your resources to financially helping out on the ground, boots on the ground that are doing the work for, uh, for helping people get back on their feet, you're more than welcome to do that. Crossview responds immediately because we believe in generosity as a church. And, and, and that goes into uh, your talents. If you can swing a hammer or if you can, uh, you can clean up some tree branches or you can work a chainsaw, uh, whatever it takes, you give of your talents. Give of your your treasures, and you say, you know what? I don't know what $10 can do, but $10 can probably do a lot for people that don't have gasoline. 
in north part, northern part of Iowa. You do something powerful. We are called to be generous. How do we be? How do we get generosity? We put others first, put ourselves last, and we ask God to bless whatever it is we give with our time, our talents, and treasures. Father God, I pray that you will just inspire us, Holy Spirit, to be generous. All of us are living on borrowed time. We never really own time. It just kind of ekes by us every day. But Lord, we are going to give an account for what we've done with our time, what we've done with the talents we've been given, and what we have done with the money we have made and earned, how we have returned that to you, that 10% we have said, take it, use it to touch other lives. God, teach us that a generous heart is a happy heart. A generous heart is a peaceful heart. And a generous heart is, 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 is open for God to do miracles through. Miracles in the home and miracles in the workplace and miracles in marriages and the miracles that take place. Because why? We're generous. When selfishness comes on the scene, when selfishness moves in, generosity is shoved out. So God, would you just search us right now? Just search us. Head bows, eyes closed here today. You know, this is real time. Today is a real talk. And I'm here to tell you today that if you struggle with generosity, God can take that heart and he can teach you how to be a generous person. Now, I know many of you in this place, you're, you're generous. I, 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 I could speak of your generosity, uh, not because you've bragged about it, but because I've watched it in effect. I've watched it touch lives. And today, you may be here and you struggle with generosity and you have to ask yourself, why do I struggle with generosity? And possibly it's because in the center of your life is selfishness. You think it's all about you. It's your money. It's your time. It's your talent. So I just want you right there where you're at. Say, God, search me. Where am I selfish? Where do I learn? I need to learn to be generous. Where, who in my life do I need to touch? Who in my life do I need to give my time to and help them out? What are my talents? And with my talents, am I using them to touch others' lives? And then finally, God, with my money, have I fallen for the lie? It's all for me. And I don't need God. I don't need him in my money, so I'm going to shove him on out and do what I want with it. Then God, change that attitude as well. Search us, God. Because, Lord, because you loved us, you gave us our only hope, and that was Jesus Christ. And Jesus, because you loved us, you suffered the brutality of the cross, you went through the pain and agony, beaten, abused, bleeding for my life. Your generosity, Jesus, proves your love for me. So Lord, may we do the same back to you. May our generosity prove our love for you, our love for humanity, our love for mankind. And may we sacrificially give of our time, our talents, and our treasures, God. We love you so much, God. Continue to speak to our hearts. Challenge our lives with generosity. Because God, if you're for us, you'll meet all of our needs according to your riches and glory. 
that song there's some there's a thought there's a thought that came to me and, and if this is you just to hear this sometimes we don't give financially to God or we don't return back to God what is his it's not always because of selfishness I think sometimes it's it's fear it's fear because we know how much we have we know how much there is going out and we get fearful there won't be enough and that song as we were singing that it says, I know you're for me. I know you're for me. It says, you will never forsake me in my weakness. That fear is a weakness. It says, I know that you will come and write on my heart the truth. And here's the truth. You don't have to fear. Because he already said, if you are generous, I will be generous back to you. So your fear is dismantled. Your fear is diminished, not because of what you do, but because of what God promises he will do for you when you're generous. And I just feel like some of you, that is what you need to understand today or hear from God today. Your generosity comes and as it comes, God says, I'll give you all your needs. Just trust me. Here at Crossview, we do a, we do a 90 day challenge. Uh, it's not something that that we do because we want you to get, we, we so believe as a church, I so believe, and the, and the board and the, the leadership so believe in generosity and returning back to God that we offer a 90-day challenge. You do tithing for 90 days, and at the end of 90 days, if you don't see a God doing a miracle, provide all your needs, not your wants, your needs, it says we'll give you all of it back. Years ago, whenever this church was financially struggling, years ago, whenever we didn't know how we were going to make a budget every single year, I remember Pastor Terry and I talking about tithing uh, a percentage of our income back to missions. We hadn't done that. We'd been generous with missions and that, but nothing on an ongoing basis. And remember many discussions that we had. We didn't know how God was going to do it. I remember sitting in a board meeting and, and us discussing it. And I remember saying this, because we all, the same thing that you guys struggle with, the church has struggled with, and that was, how do we make it if this is how much is coming in and now we're gonna take more out of that and we're gonna give it away, how are we gonna make it? And I remember sitting in that meeting and what was said was, but yet we ask our people to do it every single day. If we don't do it as a church, how can we ask our people to do it? And that was, I don't know, 12 years ago, I think it was, 12, 13 years ago. And from that point on, we started every dollar you give. Every $10 you give, a dollar comes out, we put it in missions. Every $100, $10 to missions. Every year, we give, our, we give more and more away. Uh, to the tune of 40, up to $60,000 a year to foreign missions. I don't say that to, I don't say that to uh, pat us on the back. I say that because God's promises do not fail. If you are generous, God will be generous back to you. That's the truth. So pray about that. Pray about what is your part in that. Learn from God's generosity how to be generous to others. So God, I pray that you just take us today. Let this word settle on us. We pray about it. 
God, just as your word said, not manipulating or coercing, but just saying, hey, your promises never fail. You, God, can do any miracle. There are those here today that are struggling in life. There are those here today who are financially struggling. There are those here today, God, relationships, I feel, God, are just in a, a tension place. Holy Spirit, I pray, I ask you, let your peace, let your spirit rest upon them right now and let them know you're for them, you're journeying with them, you're rooting for them, you're cheering them on, that God, if they surrender to you, God, you will do the impossible because you are for us. If God is for us, nothing can be against us. Neither height nor depth nor angels or demons, nothing can separate us from God.